Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues throughout all generations. We join to worship God together as we stand to sing the hymn, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Now let us unite our hearts and minds as we join together in prayer. Let us pray. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. It is good to praise the Lord and to make music to your name, O Most High, and to Proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. And so as we gather this morning, as we bow our heads to symbolize that we bow our lives before you, and as we close our eyes to symbolize that we would close out all the things that would distract us or hinder our fellowship or worship, we pray with the psalmist that you would open for me the gates of righteousness that I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. 
that I will give you thanks for you answered me and you've become my salvation. We bow before God who is robed in majesty, the God who is armed with strength, the God who has established the world and made it firm and secure, and whose throne was established long ago and who is from all eternity, the God whose statutes stand firm, whose holiness adorns your house for endless days. And as we come with boldness and with confidence through Jesus, we come also to confess that we have sinned by our own fault in thought, in our words and in our deeds. We have fallen short by the things that we have done and the things that we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. We acknowledge that you have made us in your image with minds to know you and hearts to love you and wills to serve you. But our knowledge is imperfect. Our love is inconstant and our obedience incomplete. We refuse to go where you lead us and we fail to grow in your likeness. You teach us to love our neighbors, but instead we build dividing walls of hostility. So we pray that you would have mercy upon us and that you would forgive us and free us from our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May we know your presence. Speak to our minds and to our hearts that we might know you more and that we might love you more. And we pray, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open all desires known and from whom no secrets are hidden, that you would cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So I used to go and visit my granddad, and when I went, he didn't have internet, no Wi-Fi, and he didn't have a flat screen colored television. He did have a television, but it was big, and it was black and white, and there were two channels. And usually, at some stage, you had to go and thump it on the side to stop the picture rolling. He didn't have very many pictures on the wall. And he didn't have very many luxuries at all. But he did have this picture. And I think my grandmother must have made this. And they must have been so delighted with it that they put it in a frame. And you may have seen this or you may have seen something similar. Home, the place where we grumble the most and are treated the best. Home, the place where we grumble the most and are treated the best. And I think, you know, in that particular home, it didn't have very many luxuries at all. There were plenty of things to grumble about, for sure. But it was a place that they knew that they were treated really, really well. Now, I wonder, are you a grumbler? Do you grumble? Anybody grumble? No? Oh, well, some honest enough to say, yeah, I'm a bit of a grumbler. I have lots of things to grumble about. So, or are you a, pe a person who's grateful? Where are all the grateful people this morning? Where, where, put your hand up if you're grateful. There we go, that's much better. We have more people who are grateful who, than people who are grumblers. I know a man whose name was Horner. Here we go. And he used to live in Grumble Corner. Grumble Corner in Crosspatch Town. And he never was seen without a frown. He grumbled at this. He grumbled at that. He grumbled at the dog and he grumbled at the cat. He grumbled at morning. And he grumbled at night. 
and to grumble and growl was his chief delight. He grumbled so much at his wife that she began to grumble as well as he, and all the children, wherever they went, reflected their parents' discontent. If the sky was dark and betokened rain, then Mr. Horner was sure to complain. And if there was not a cloud about, he crumbled because of a threatened drought. His meals were never to suit his taste. He grumbled at having to eat in haste. The bread was poor or the meat was tough, or else he hadn't had half enough. No matter how hard his wife would try to please her husband, with scornful eye he'd look around and then with a scowl at something or other he'd begin to growl. Well, one day as I walked down the street, my old acquaintance I chanced to meet, whose face was without the look of care and the ugly frown that had drifted there. I may be mistaken, perhaps, I said, as after saluting I turned my head, but it is, and it isn't, the Mr. Horner who used to live on Grumble Corner. I met him next day and I met him again in melting weather and in pelting rain when stocks were up and where stocks were down but a smile somehow had replaced the frown, and it puzzled me much. And so one day I seized his hand in a friendly way and said, Mr. Horner, I'd like to know what can have happened to change you so. <laughs> he laughed, a laugh that was good to hear, for it told of a conscience calm and clear. And he said with none of his old-time drawl, Why, I've changed my residence, that is all. Yes, said Horner, it wasn't healthy on Grumble Corner. And so I've moved, it was a change complete. And you'll find me now on Thanksgiving Street. Home, the place where we grumble the most, and are treated the best. And what we need to do is to be people who say thank you. See how many times today you can say thank you for all the good things that we have to enjoy. And that's why one of the reasons that we come to church, to say thank you, to say thank you to God for all the blessings and all the good things that come from his hand, and to say thank you for Jesus, our friend and our saviour. So be a person of gratitude, not a grumbler, as we give our thanks to God. Now, before we sing a song that uh, reminds us and encourages us to do that, I'm going to reverse a little bit because I've overlooked this morning's Old Testament reading. So I'm going to read that because that's important even for later on in the service. And for that, we turn to uh, the Old Testament and to the book of Isaiah and to chapter 6. This is the word of God. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin atoned for. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. 
Amen, and may God bless to us this reading from his word. And now we're going to join to sing a praise, Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. Give thanks for what the Lord has done. Well, the announcements for this week are printed on the bulletin, but uh, to add to those, just two other notices I, I think that uh, we want to bring to your attention. One is to say that the members class uh, will continue, but not tonight, next week for three weeks. I understand that the membership class met last Sunday evening, uh, and while it won't meet this evening, it will meet next Sunday evening, uh, and then uh, for the two weeks following that. And then also to highlight that there will be a prayer meeting on Thursday of this week at 7.30. And now we continue to worship God as we bring our offering.
Now let us unite together in prayer. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And as we bow before you, we pray that you would hear us, and that as we come before you, that we uh, lift to you the needs of others. We pray today for the young people under our care. We're conscious of the various pressures that are brought to bear upon them in their formative years, the influence of their peers, the influence of various media. We pray for homes from which they come and for the influence of godly examples, for homes where Christ is the head of the house, the chosen guest at every meal and the acknowledged silent listener of every conversation. And we ask that every home and every church would seek to raise a generation of young people who remember the Creator in the days of their youth. We pray too for those who feel the burden of the years weighing heavily upon them. And we hold in your presence all who are being cared for in their homes, in nursing homes or on hospital ward. We give you thanks for the dedication and the ministrations of doctors and nurses and all who care. And it is our prayer that they might know your presence with them, that they might know that you are their strength, that you are the great physician, the one who comes to heal and to restore and to save and whose presence is assured and from which we cannot be parted. We remember today those who have been recently bereaved, those who know the loss of a loved one in their home or in their heart. And we pray that their sorrow might be tempered by the hope of the good news of Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life. Today we pray for our own country and we pray into the situation of political stalemate that has left us without local governance. We pray for our troubled world. We pray that efforts to resolve conflicts might be successful and that war might cease. That the leaders of the world might know that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. God, our Father, as our faces differ, so too do our needs. And so in a moment of quietness, we bring before you the silent prayers of our own hearts. We thank you, O oh God, that you hear us and that you hear us not for our much asking, but because we bring our prayers through Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now we're going to stand together to worship as we use the words of the hymn, We love the place, O God, wherein thine honour dwells.
Now, our, our New Testament reading is taken from the Gospel according to Mark and uh, reading some verses from verse 14. Mark's Gospel, chapter 14, and reading from the first verse. Now, the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those who were present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them at any time you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Amen. And may God bless to us this reading from his word. The story that we've just read uh, in Mark's gospel, the story of a woman who broke a very expensive perfume over Jesus is told in all of the four gospels. But Mark's gospel is the shortest of the four gospels. And what Mark do did was to collect all the eyewitness accounts and the memories of Peter, and he carefully collated them uh, together. And so if Matthew and Luke serve up the gospel in the slow cooker, then Mark serves it up in the microwave. And you get in the Gospel of Mark this repetition of the, world, of the word immediately, and immediately, and immediately. You could read that right from the beginning, and immediately. And the word immediately is like the ding of the bell. And Matthew and Luke love Christmas, but Mark can't wait to get to Easter. The Gospel of Mark is just like a, the Easter story with a big, long introduction. And now the momentum is building, and it was immediately prior to the Passover, and it was Jesus last night outside Jerusalem prior to his crucifixion. It was packed. Crowds and crowds of people estimated that there could have been up to uh, two million people who had gone to the Passover. And if we had been able to move among them and listen to their conversations, all the chat would have been along the lines of political intrigue and social injustice and the dreadful oppression of the Roman authorities. And so with national pride, they spoke of liberation. And the overthrow of Roman imperialism, maybe now this is the time. Maybe this is the time to end the dreadful ravages of uh, 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 national prejudice. And then Mark takes us out of the crowd. It's strange in a way when he's so keen to get to the cross that he's going to punctuate the journey by going to the relative obscurity of a man named Simon the leper where there's a dinner party. And a woman came. Now why would he punctuate the journey on the way to the cross to tell this story? The first thing that we realize about this woman is that she came prepared. Here's a woman with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. Wasn't that she just came with a little spray in her purse and thought, well, maybe this will do, finding herself in the situation. But no, she came carrying an alabaster jar. A Roman pound was about 12 ounces, and therefore this is substantial. It's not 
easily concealed about her. You couldn't notice the lady and not notice the fact that she's carrying this jar. And she carried it with her because what she is about to do is premeditated. It's planned. It's intentional. And if worship is going to be entered into properly, then it is going to have to be premeditated and planned and intentional. We need to be encouraging each other towards that, uh, to make every effort to be here for corporate worship uh, when it is called on a Sunday morning. For your presence is necessary and it is significant, and we come together already predetermined that we're going to participate with prepared hearts and prepared minds, and to say with the psalmist, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. This is Gustav Mahler. Now, actually, this comp uh, composer and conductor, this musician, there were apparently only two photographs of him when he was conducting, and they were both of his back. So what you see here is a, a photograph or a picture of Gustav Mahler that is generated by AI, by artificial intelligence. And from a very early age, it was obvious that, that this man was musically gifted. And after graduating from the Vienna Conservatory, he held a succession of con conducting posts rising in importance throughout the, the, the music houses of Europe and it culminated in the pinnacle of his career whenever he was appointed as the director of the Vienna Court Opera. That's back in 1897. And so he arrived in Vienna and all the public in Vienna, you know, there's a cafe culture there and, and, and they, they were enjoying a sort of a hedonistic lifestyle and they relished in artistic activities but they were really pretty relaxed and casual in their approach to it all. So if they went to the opera, they really weren't particularly fussed about the opera. They wanted to see their mates and catch up with one another, and they didn't pay a lot of attention to what was going on. And so uh, Mahler, with his more serious approach and, and a more intense uh, attitude towards his music, well, very soon clashed with the public he instituted a number of changes that we would now consider common practice. For him, these are serious matters. And uh, he had unprecedented high standards as an artist. And for the personal integrity of what was happening, he just wanted the public to sort of um, come into focus and, and, and to apply themselves. And so the first thing he did was he managed to stop the clacks or, or the groupies that favoured one particular singer and another, and he demanded the highest standards of discipline from his colleagues. And where there were uh, performances, for example, of, of Wagner's operas that had been cut down and made short so that it was more palatable for the public, uh, well, he made them the proper original length. And he demanded that everybody would come on time. So if you're not here on time, you don't get in. And no one is excluded from that, even the most eminent citizens in Vienna, including its royalty. And he turned off the lights so that your focus is not on all your friends all around about you, but your focus is on the stage and what's happening there. And he introduced intervals so that the public could go out and have a smoke break and chat to their friends and he then also decided that he was going to put the longest and the most difficult works at the beginning of his concerts in the hope that that would stop the people leaving early, which they were apt to do. Well, the public were pretty resistant to all of these um, changes that, that he had initiated and, and, and his personal enthusiasm uh, for the integrity of what was happening eventually suffocated the liberal Viennese who were accustomed to just something a bit more casual and easygoing. Now, as, as I think about that and as I share that with you, if that's the reverence and the respect that was shown for secular offerings, how much more should we be reverent as we approach God? 
It seems to me that preparation for worship is less than what it once was. As I recall it, preparation for worship on a Sunday morning started no later than a Saturday evening. And I remember growing up at 29 minutes past the hour, Joe would come in with the Bible and he would put it on the pulpit. And I would think to myself as a boy, well, there's Joe coming in at the last minute again. But Joe knew exactly what he was doing with reverence and with respect. He would carry the, bul- the, the Bible into the pulpit and he would open it to symbolize the open word of God, the centrality of the word of God and the primacy of, the, of preaching. And it was all preparation for what was about to happen. It was all intentional. And I watched as people would come in and they would go into their pews and they would bow their head in prayer as intentionally they prepared to meet with God. Somebody said, is there anything special happening in your church this week? Not this church, but in in your church. And the reply was, well, during the week, we prayed that we would know the presence of God. Were you thinking of anything more special than that? When Isaiah had a vision of, of God in the temple, and he saw the holiness of God, that attribute of God that is repeated to the third degree, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The first thing he did was he put his hands to his lips and he said, I've, I've got a dirty mouth. Woe is me. There, in the Bible, there are oracles of will and oracles of woe. And a, an oracle of will is good news. An oracle of woe is bad news. And the first woe that he pronounced was on himself, the prophet. He said, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the Lord Almighty. And so as we prepare to gather, we understand something that the writer in Ecclesiastes says, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. So let your words be few. All of these things have to do with an act of a will, not a feeling, but with a commitment. And this lady who is arriving in this context is a lady who comes prepared. And the second thing we notice about this is that uh, there is a cost to her worship. There's a cost of the worship that she displayed. This alabaster jar is not of some cheap quality. She wouldn't have picked it up in pound stretcher or the like. It was something of great value. It was made from rare dried Himalayan plants. Half a litre would cost about 6,000 pounds. And so her premeditated action was one of great cost. But the monetary value wasn't as significant as what it meant to her as a woman. For this kind of possession was often a family heirloom, and it may have been purchased for her by her father. She may have bought it for herself as a result of her prosperity, but she had a jar of perfume for one of two reasons. Either it was to be used as a dowry for her wedding, or it was to be used in face of her own burial so that in the embalming process they may take it and they may prepare her for her passage out of this time and into eternity. And so the worship that this woman displayed was at a great cost, much greater than finance, because in this particular action, you see, she surrenders her personal plans. She surrenders her personal ambitions, her aspirations for the future, and she did not care about her social acceptability in the present. And so if worship is to be genuine, it requires preparation. And if worship is to be genuine, there must be some cost. Well, all of us can come and just sing along, but what is displayed here is something that is much more significant. And then thirdly, as we see, 
that, that she came prepared and there was a cost to her worship, we, we see thirdly that there was a criticism that she endured for what she did. It tells us in verse 4, some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. Judas, Judas Iscariot was leading the charge. Judas was a thief. He didn't get a rip for the poor. He just saw all of this through his greedy eyes, and he resented the fact that this lady would pick something worth a year's wages, and he would use, would use it to express her devotion to Jesus. That she would pick something that should have been used as a diary, that something that could have been used for her burial, and that she would do this with it. And she endured the criticism that was revealed in their resentment and in their rebuke. You stupid woman, they must have said or thought. What a strange person. What a silly person she is. We don't do that sort of thing around here, you know. And they belittled her. And they saw her service only in terms of money. But she recognized who Jesus was while they missed the point. Because you see, the, the, the Jewish prophetic vision of a future national restoration and the universal establishment of God's kingdom became firmly associated with their return to Israel under the offspring of David's house who would be the, the Lord's anointed. And the literal translation of the Hebrew word Messiah is anointed. And it refers to a ritual of consecrating someone or something by putting holy oil upon it. It literally means one smeared with oil. And a popular title for the promised future king of Israel was anointed one. And it evolves from God's method of marking people set aside for a specific purpose and granting them authority. The high priest of the temple was anointed before service. Samuel, the priest and the prophet, anointed King Saul and King David. And not only were these men handpicked by God for a special task, they were empowered by the presence of his spirit and protected by their status as God's anointed. It was the prophet Isaiah looking forward to the future promised king and the savior of Israel, names uh, the one who would remove all burdens from his people as the anointed one. And then Luke records in chapter 4, Jesus says, that's me. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind to set the oppressed free. And so Jesus is the fulfillment of the anointed one that the prophet Isaiah is talking about in Isaiah 61. And so that symbolism is not lost on Jesus. He understood and he said to her, her act will be told in memory of her. So while she re uh, endured the, the, the rebukes and the condemnation of others, she was commended by the Lord Jesus. Leave her alone, Jesus said. It's not often that you find Jesus jumping in this way to someone's defense. And then he asks this question, why are you bothering her? Well, they must have said or at least thought, what do you mean, why are we bothering? Look, look at the stupid thing that she has done. She's taking perfume worth about a thousand pounds and, and she pours it all over the place. And Jesus said, she has done a beautiful thing. The poor you will always have with you. You can help them anytime you want. It's not that he was uninterested in the poor. No one was more interested in the poor. He himself was the essence of poverty in his life and his ministry. And don't cloud the issue, said Jesus. She has done a beautiful thing because she recognized who Jesus was and she recognized what Jesus was about to do. And when you and when I understand who Jesus is, and the wonderful thing that Christ has done, it will change our whole approach to worship. 
And if we don't do that, if we don't focus on Jesus, then we're in danger of becoming part of a group known for its harsh rebukes and its deep resentment. And we come thinking not of the cost or the commitment, but knowing the privilege of responding to his grace. And finally this, what she did made a lasting impression. Jesus said, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And she poured the oil to memorialize him, but he says, remember her. Now, we don't know who else was in the room. There are many things about Jesus' life and ministry that remain as a a closed book to us. But what this lady has done has been reported for the last 2,000 years. Why? Why? Because the Spirit of God recognizes that the events that are up and public are not as significant as the events that are down and private. God is not interested in our narcissistic displays. God deals with our heart. And it's so often the case here, the issue is one of brokenness. She broke the jar and she put it on his the, the, the perfume on his head and she carried the jar if she'd carried the jar around and held it tightly to herself and, 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 and maybe just put a wee drop on his head and then put the lid tight back on again it's doubtful whether we'd ever have had this recorded in the gospels it might have been acceptable but it wouldn't have been very dramatic but it's the radical way in, in which she takes all of her security and all that represents her future And she broke it in order that she might show her devotion to Jesus. What about your life, your agenda, your ambition, your worship of the Lord Jesus Christ? And so like the lady, we'll come prepared because we know whom we come to worship. And we're aware of all that God has done in Christ. And we're aware that there's a cost in true worship. But we know that we're the recipients of his grace. And that we are truly blessed. And may we ever be thankful. May God write the truth of his word on all our hearts. And to his name be all glory and praise. Amen. We're going to join to sing a wonderful hymn, I Will Sing the Wondrous Story of the Christ Who Died for Me.
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day. And until Jesus comes or calls, and then forevermore. Amen.